What's up, everybody? Welcome to another episode of Game Dev Unchained, the number one podcast about game development and the lifestyle thereof. I am your host, Brandon Pham, and I have two special guests from the Perforce team that is joining me this week. A welcome return to Brad Hart and Johan Carlson. I kind of pick up there. How are you guys doing? Good. We're, We're doing, doing great. great. Yes. All right. So uh, before we get started, this is the part of the podcast where I'll let you guys introduce yourselves to our listeners out there. Uh, so let's go ahead and start with Brad. Who are you with? A short synopsis since you've been on the podcast before. Um, yeah, yeah, yeah. So, so for sure, Brad Hart, CTO, CTO uh, at Air Force, Force, where I oversee the Helios Core, Core Version Control, Control product, product. Uh, the handsaw product. product. Yohan's going to talk, talk about our online products, products, Rebel products, products and, and um, really just, just excited to be back, back on the show again, talking, talking about trends that we've, that we've seen in the industry from our survey. And, and uh, you, you know, again, looking forward to kind of connecting again here. Yes, yes, and my, my name, name is Johan Karlsson. I'm um, calling from Stockholm, Sweden, Sweden today. That's why I did dark in the background here. here. I've, I've been, been working, working with Hansoft for the past seven years, years and I joined the force when they acquired Hansoft three or almost, almost four years, years ago. ago. I think so I'm working as a consultant, helping, helping our customers, customers, a lot of them are game developers, and also working on the product, product management side of Hansoft. Perfect. So, one of the biggest things, of course, that has happened this year and seems to be a year that's getting weirder and weirder. I don't know if you guys been caught up with the jetpack guy over LAX. Uh, <laughs> I, I feel like we're just one month away from an alien popping out and saying hello. Um, on top of that, of course, primarily we got COVID. And one of the main things I wanted to talk to you guys about, because you guys have done uh, a pretty heavy research of the effects of COVID and how it's affecting the workplace and what what is the long-term view of everything. So we'd love to kind of just dig into that and and let's go start with Johan. Like, can you give us an overview of of what I butchered and, and give us a little more information about that? So, so what we've seen with the COVID, COVID situation has been quite a few different things. From, from I mean, one part of it is what we're seeing from a perspective of us as a tool vendor, the need for using tools as a distributed team and so forth. And then. What we did recently is then also, you know, what does this mean for our customers, game developers around the world? We did a survey. We asked about 500 game developers, you know, what does this mean to them? And one of the things is going to change game development forever, more or less. And one of the reasons there is, you know, how we can actually work remote. You can actually work as distributed teams. And the technologies are there now, how we can do this. There's Zoom meetings. There's, there's good backlog tools. There's good version control where you can move assets around very quickly and so forth. So uh, I think we're seeing implications both in terms of, of how people organize uh, their production sequence. And then lastly, of course, what it means for the, the, them as to build the games for the players. What does this mean for, for you know, the, you know, when we turn up real sports, so to say, you can no longer go to a real NFL match or things like that. The rise of things like esports and, and games that are focused on that and uh, the alternatives that games can offer, the alternative world, the alternative realism. That games can offer uh, in, in yeah the COVID. And one of, one of the biggest thing, and we kind of talked touched this a bit, Brad, when the last time you were on. Mm -hmm. uh, the, the realities have changed. There's a more dependency on on the internet more than ever before, and uh, we even talked about net neutrality. I think the first time we talked about mm -hmm. um, when, when you were on and. I mean, how did, I mean, they're banking hard now. Right. Uh, I, I think there was like a few months where they kind of had like a forgiveness thing, but like, uh, at least in California, how, how they kind of gave back our plastic bags, they're charging us again. And uh, it's it's been kind of weird and awful uh, on that front uh, now that everyone is on. Yeah, well, it's really pushing the limits too. I mean, the... Um... You know, one of the things we've seen with our customers uh, in the game development world, uh, we've got all the big ones, right? So we're dealing with smaller companies and then really the biggest of the big is the sort of piggyback off what Johan was saying too, is remote work. People were concerned about it and it, it is now how people are going to do their work, right? It's here to stay. Um, so from a development perspective, there was a lot of our customers were moving massive data, massive server farms into the into the into the cloud. Um, that was they had the project to do it, and this kind of pushed them all over the edge. And that's putting you know 
limits on bandwidth, right? Um, as, as these things are going all across the globe and people are just trying to do their job, not just play a game, right? They're trying to do their work and they're dealing with bandwidth issues uh, where things are being capped. And um, that's really painful for people, you know, actually trying to put food on their table, um, let alone just trying to enjoy themselves on a Friday night and play some games and have some fun. So it's a, it's a challenge, right? Um, but we really have seen that trend is that that rocket is lit and running and everything servers, everything's going into the cloud uh, where traditionally IP was always kept locally on prem. People are putting it up there to give access to people globally. They have to do it now uh, remotely. Uh, one of our one of our best customers just built the whole environment where the entire game development environment, everything they need is running on a server in the cloud. And then people will just, you know, terminal window in and do their work, which helps alleviate some of that. Uh, we're, you know, dealing with the bandwidth to the home. Right. Um, but yeah, no, it's a challenge. It's a challenge. And, you know, I think everybody wanted to look like a hero, right? A lot of these companies uh, the, in the, you know, the internet providers, you know, they want to look like heroes at the beginning of COVID and Hey, look, we're going to give you free. We're going to, you know, remove limits and all that. Um, but you know, <laughs> it all comes back to business, right? And if they can get it, they'll, they'll, they'll take it. Yeah, definitely. I, I think it's, um, realistically common sense have told us that this would have been longer or as long as it's been right. Mm -hmm. I mean, the last vaccine took four years and that was the quickest, um, optimistically everybody wanted this thing to be over 36 months right which uh you know the internet companies i mean in a way they were banking on it lasting longer uh so in a way they're doing fine um and i i think uh, it's kind of like what the survey and we'll go more into it johan real quick about why um why certain companies kind of had like looking like the hero type of mentality like a lot of companies I felt like um, had their wires crossed for a while and, and then finally f finding the grips to, to, to make functionality happen um, internally through friends, externally uh, through context, you know, it's, it's been a struggle. I think today, especially too, um, I the CEO of Netflix pretty much, you know, title wise said it was a net, negative of this whole work from home experience and as soon as they can get back in the office they will uh it is an adjustment it's a different way of thinking and it, it we might have the time because of how things are playing out to really force our way through for every company to go on board finally um i don't see that changing but i think it is that type of mentality is that you brute force you're just gonna have to deal with this this is the way things are right. even with the vaccine so Johan, like through your research, through the things and the paper that you've published, uh, your team has published, like what, what kind of a subject pertaining to this that you can give a little bit more light on? So, I mean, I can just first start by personal anecdote. I mean, I was scheduled to do a training in, in Florida in March or, or late March, I think it was. And then, you know, we, we had a meeting about when this whole thing broke out, I think it was end of February or something like that. And we we're talking about, well, you know, we probably have to push this out to June because as I said, I'm in Sweden, you know, they were in the US, they were starting to shadow flights and things like that. And we all had a mindset that this is probably going to be something that's going to be over in a couple of months in one way or another. This, you know, we cannot shut down economies for your <laughs> people for lock them down from their homes for a long period of time. And, and I can tell you still that training hasn't happened uh, on site, but we could start doing things online very quickly. And I think that is something that we resonate through the research we've done is that many things that were deemed to be impossible, quote unquote, you know, we have always been a studio where everyone has always worked, you know, in the studio, you have to come in, we got our, our stationary PCs who are working by here. Through the heroes in many IT departments, that essentially changed overnight. So, but that means also that you need to change your whole view on innovation. That's one, one of the challenges that several have raised here uh, of the people that we serve it. How do you remain innovative as a game studio if you're not able to have face-to-face -face conversations and chat and, and you know try gameplay mechanics and things like that so one thing is now you know so technology works working uh, remotely and working distributed uh, and there are many challenges about that but one relates to for an innovative industry like the game and dev industry how do we remain innovative so you know how do we do our you know, physical whiteboards, well, we need to put that on a, on a digital whiteboard instead. 
uh, with Kanban poses and so forth. How do we do things like uh, uh, daily stand-ups or how do we do things like like uh, early game testing and so forth if you don't get the look and feel of, of people doing these kind of things. So that has been some of the challenges, the collaboration part, the things that are removed when you're not together as a team and used to the habits that you have and, and knowing each other. That has been one type of challenge. Uh, but then there's also been some some people who raised then uh, benefits in terms of how this might help uh, include more people uh, in in game studio. How can this improve inclusivity? People who cannot make it to get game studio every day, uh, maybe because they need to take care of small children, or maybe because they're far away, or for other reasons. Now we can start to onboard new team members anywhere in the world, essentially. So that's then coming in as there's not only problems with with the whole situation here. There's also opportunities. And for some of these game studios, what, uh, there was a comment from one of them about how actually for some smaller studios, the whole COVID situation, the fact that people are playing more games, it gives a bigger revenue. It actually gives, you know, for this specific industry, it, for some titles at least, it has not had an enormous business impact. It had almost been like a positive impact for some of them and open up possibilities in that. And so it's I mean, it's overall a very sad situation, of course, but there are, are definitely studios who are trying to do the, make the best out of it. That's what we're learning. I yeah, just to kind of jump off that, if I may, the, uh, um, you know, what is obviously a very large problem has become an opportunity uh, as, you know, this remote work challenge. Maybe there's somebody who lives in a country or a state or a city where they would never get the opportunity to work at their dream job, right? Work with their dream game development company. And it just wasn't an option. There was a technology was too difficult, especially at the smaller individual person level. And this has forced companies to solve that problem. So I don't, you know, the, what we, what we've seen again, we, so we surveyed over 500, uh, 500 game developers for, for our, our state of the, you know, game, uh, game development industry in 2020, you can get to perforce.com website, uh, some pretty interesting statistics there um, that they're happy doing it. People like having the option to work remote now that it is actually an option uh, because the technology has had to be put into place so that people could work effectively. And, you know, I think the overall net is going to be positive because there will be some flexibility. There will be some choice there will be opportunity for people across the globe to collaborate when in this particular type of vertical uh, traditionally was very difficult. Uh, and that's something that we at Perforce focus on the tools and the products that we're building, uh, partnering with the cloud companies so that we can offer an environment where people can be extremely productive regardless of where they're sitting. Yeah. I mean, it's definitely one of those um, bigger issues here. Like, with, with with people being impacted in, in such a big way, throw in the mix of being full-time teachers now for, for parents. Um, it, 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 if anything, prolongs the process of figuring this out because now you have, you're juggling a bunch of things. And, and it is a thing that we do have to learn to cope. Uh, even though these companies are very optimistically wanting to get back to work, uh, there's always going to be some kind of hybrid um, version of that because most people are very used to this now, um, mm -hmm. especially uh, they're working towards being productive at it every day. And so by the time we get back to the office, good chances are companies are going to be really well off uh, with the structure and uh, the taste of, of freedom uh, within mm -hmm. the workplace and working at home. I think a lot of people will have a lot a hard time letting that go and would rather kind of brute force learn how to cope working like this than to go back to what was normal before, right? So I think there's a lot of resistance, um, at least on the employee side, to kind of let's really iron out the the, the, the kinks and, and figure this out. Um, well, for sure. Yeah. You know, and I think the, uh, you know, the old argument of, well, it can't work, right? We can't communicate. We don't have the infrastructure to share these big binary files all over the globe and there'll be communication breakdowns and all that. That has proven like completely moot, right? We, so many companies, we, we work very hard at it. I know a lot of the, our, our customers in the game development and film world, et cetera, semiconductor world, they figured it out through brute force. And then now 
it's only going to, you know, the rising tide lifts all boats, right? So whether it's all remote, all in the office, or people are doing a hybrid thing, and, you know, as we come out of this, there'll be better efficiency that we've learned to do. There's better communication. There's better technology that's been put in place. So overall, I think there will be a great uh, advantage that what we have learned how to do how to do better in this environment. So then, when when the environment loosens up a little bit, it's only going to be that much better. Again, again, that's you know when we look at the survey, you know some of the biggest challenges people have is around velocity, right? Time to market, trying to reuse assets, things that they just want to go faster to meet their deadlines. Uh, nobody ever has enough people, right? Uh, so. How do they get more efficient? And again, it's through working through some of these kinks, right? The technology, the communication, right? The sharing of data, sharing of information. It has had to be fixed in this environment. So it's just going to help, you know, overall. I mean, again, those are really three of the top three challenges that people highlighted in the survey. Mm-hmm. Oh, what, Johan, so one of the the biggest thing in the survey that, that I, was, I was looking at, AR and VR has always been like, a fun thing to watch grow, right? And uh, one of the highlights have been seeing that space because of people uh, wanting to kind of connect more, right? AR, VR seems like the closest thing outside of Facebook or something, right? That we can connect through online interaction. Um, So how has that impacted? How has COVID impacted the acceleration of VR and AR development? And, and even to take that one step above, the, 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 the fact of realism, overall digital realism, how do we get a, a real digital experience? Um, I think that it, that is something that we, I mean, many people, when we did this survey, highlighted how important and how much of a trend they think this will be now as, as devices are going down in, in cost and that actually people who are at home more and more are able to consume this better and actually maybe are willing to invest more also in, in their uh, virtual reality and AR are experiences. Some people mentioned potential new devices coming up with, with like you know, Apple's new glasses. Some mentioned the focus on realism also outside of the more classical things. So like, you know, the, the Epic's acquisition of Quixel, for example, and then UE5 as something that could enable quite a lot in the space of how do we make more realistic games and how do we make sure that we get a more real experience as we are um, yeah, building new games right now. So that's definitely something that, that will have a big impact. And I think that's been the search right in the AR VR world. What's going to be the, the real hit? You know, what's going to make this take off? But from what we're hearing from these, these 500 people who serve it, they, they think that this is this may be it, this time we're, we're in right now. Yeah, the, the sign right now is because that we're, we're not distracted with like living life <laughs> outside <laughs> of our computer. <laughs> It's really pushing everybody to figure out how to, like we, we've been saying all throughout this podcast, to, to cope with living like this. Um, and the earlier, the better, in my opinion. It's very much the same way that, you know, you, you guys probably have friends and family that have been itching like the next month will be the, the month where we can exit and, and live life again. And they are the ones that are always at the breaking points of, of snapping, right? And it's the one that are the healthiest with the outlook being, you know, where it's going to be like this the next three years because history shows that's that's how long it takes uh, to kind of figure this out. Are uh, finding other ways to kind of cope by just internally uh, having introspective reflections, <laughs> philosophy, or anything that can figure out to like, hey, if I pace from one end of my room to another, for the next four years, can I be sane enough to continue? And if the answer is yes, by reading books or uh, self-improvement, AR, VR, any type of game development uh, specifically uh, to complete that cycle, uh, I see a lot of people having more success uh, with that frame of mind uh, in general. Uh, Aside from this, though, uh, I would want to throw this question to either of you guys. 2020, um, don't know if it's COVID-related, it might be, but like with 5G streaming, uh, everything online related, have I really do think has been really fast paced more than the years before. Uh, I mean, naturally it was on a uh, uprise, uh, but this year alone, I feel like every month there's been something internet related uh, with 
Elon Musk shooting satellites up in the sky faster with 5G suddenly coming out from all these uh, major phone carriers. And then uh, with esports being announced with every major battle royale game, like things seems to be cascading into a, a bigger thing. Um, mm-hmm. Is is that intuition kind of correct? Like, what is it COVID related, or what? What exactly is happening where we're we're just hearing this cascade of news? I mean, five G started long before a pandemic, right? So we've the interesting thing when you work for a company like Perforce, because we of course work with in companies across a wide range of different industries. So I've been talking to the people that are actually building the five G, right? The, the radio base station providers and so forth. And, and, you know, there's been thousands or tens of thousands of engineers involved of building this technology for a long period of time. And the interesting thing now, when we start seeing these 5G zones coming up and, and devices and so forth, how it all kind of fits together. And suddenly now, we, I mean, before I think the main drive would be, you know, people are mobile, people are moving everywhere. That's going to be the big thing. And what's happening in mobile games, uh, that's going to be a huge enabler for, for 5G. And, the reduction of latency and, and also, of course, tied into how these different streaming services could then be used anywhere. How uh, now, actually, you know, now you can get really, really good bandwidth connections while this is being rolled out to work from anywhere. How people are maybe, you know, moving out from the cities to live outside of the cities and be allowed to work from there because 5G could be an enabler of them being, being able to both work and play games and do other things at the same quality as they might be used from in the city. So there are you know, once again, the technology is being boosted by the pandemic, but it's being a long, long, long journey on 5G. And I think that is also something that's going to be very strong and a very big enabler for many different types of, of game experiences, which is also what we we see in the responses that we're getting from, um, yeah, game developers. Mm-hmm. You know, and I think the, uh, just to tag on to that, I think the, you know, it just historically, right, innovation comes in waves. Right. Uh, any, any, you know, every five, 10 years, there's just an influx of new technology because everybody's racing. They, they, they're racing to become the next big thing. And it's going across, you know, different verticals in the technology industry, but it's all kind of tied together and it's all enabled. So maybe somebody wants to create the next great, you know, big streaming platform. Well, they're going to need 5G to get there. Right. And 5G doesn't mean anything unless people are using that pipe. So it's kind of like everybody's being carried together towards sort of that next uh, innovation era. I mean, it's happened in DevOps. It's happened uh, in every possible category, chip design, et cetera. Um, and I think the uh, the thing, too, is with streaming and, again, some of the feedback we got, you know, streaming, mobile gaming, those trends are going to continue to rapidly grow and dominate because people want to have experience everywhere right they don't want to be limited to i have to have my cat six cable plugged into my desktop right and to, to have a good gaming experience or any kind of experience work experience etc so the more connectivity we have the more freedom people get uh to to literally do whatever they could do at home they could do it anywhere um or they don't have to be at the office to be able to you know to to, to run big data types of operations etc so I think it's uh, it's just all blossoming together. And I think that's where, you know, people are getting excited in all these industries. The other thing to keep in mind is what's behind this as well is there's a lot of money flowing into these companies, right? This stuff doesn't just happen. Um, so these companies are taking on all of these gaming companies that we deal with, all the infrastructure companies we're dealing with. They're taking in a lot of funding money uh, to accelerate because everybody wants to be first and grab those consumer dollars, right? And, and just to one thing I've noticed there, a new term for me, at least in the past year, has been more and more projects are starting up where they're building AAA mobile games. I don't know if that if that's something, Brandon, you're aware of since before, but for me, that's a kind of ner- new thing that you're having kind of AAA size of the project, but you're actually focusing on building a purely mobile experience. And of course, 5G is one of the enablers of, of why those kind of projects are, are in the making. Yeah, definitely. I think what's... Um tying into a lot of this is what you guys are saying at first when people were kind of um, stuck at home games is a natural entertainment one of the entertainment that people kind of try to pass the time with and of course mobile devices the king of all devices to to play games and of course um naturally we thought freemium games or these cheaper games uh, would succeed pretty well and which shown 
they have. And so we're, we're converting a lot of non-gamers to gamers in this period, which I've discussed with past guests before. I mean, this is a period where a lot of uh, people are, are new to the gaming space or are taking in games and, and then slowly evolving to more mature games, like games that we've kind of grown up and love or, or stay within the mobile space, but at least playing, you know, a little bit more complicated type of games mm-hmm. uh, as time goes on. And so with the mobile device kind of growing, we also see the streaming uh, aspect of it. Just people just watching people play games uh, explode in a big way to more people, I think, are just more in tune and, and constantly having, I don't know, white noise in the background or something because it's so quiet and boring um, uh, at times just working from home and hearing the kids yelling in the back. And so those two space are, are definitely working in tandem with each other. Uh, and I, I, I fully believe too, uh, a lot of what we've been saying, you know, last couple of years with AAA kind of paying attention to mobile uh, in a big way. And of course, like Fortnite and PUBG, all these have been having a big impact in the mobile space and seeing a lot of success. And uh, developers are, I've been saying this a long time, the future is mobile with mobile just being better every year uh, at a faster rate than our PC upgrades. Um, and AAA are, are slowly just much like how um, you guys are dealing with a lot of non-gaming companies starting to use game engines to produce yep. their work. Uh, a lot of AAA are kind of seeing the mobile space as that where the mobile space is finally catching up to AAA quality. Uh, it's a natural kind of transition for gamer game developers internally to kind of look at mobile as a serious device as one of the next Xbox or PlayStation as part of their tiers to kind of release their game. So like all this kind of guesses that we've had, like since Brad, you were on the second time are, are, are seeing, I see totally in fruition and um, it's great. Uh, in spite of you know what's horrible <laughs> what's horribly <laughs> happening it's great for the game industry kind of seeing people not get distracted uh in other ways and just putting the focus on the future of game development which is streaming mobile and you know triple a looking at alternative um development methods uh that is a lot more profitable which is the big thing uh it's, yep. it's a definitely a new age for sure I mean, imagine this pandemic 20 years ago or 30 years ago. Yeah. yeah. It would be a very different thing, right? In terms of, of the, the entertainment that you could consume and how it would have been experienced and how likely it would have been you actually been able to keep people at, in their homes for an extended period of time. Like, like, And adding then on top of this in terms of, you know, giving a realistic experience, adding, you know, building out the technology that supports all of this. And also now if you can add like a sports element or something, you know, engaging about this to make sure you know, this this is something that is is all of these trends that we're kind of seeing, they, they fit very well together. And they probably would have happened even without a pandemic supporting, but this became like the catalyst now that, that fast forwards the whole world, you know, 10, 20, maybe I don't know how far into the future in terms of, of digitization. I don't know if you've seen this meme going around on a Twitter and other places like, you know, who's the main driver for the digitization of your company or of your firm and so forth. And there are different choices like the CTO or so forth. And then it's like, COVID as a number one choice, you know, there's, there hasn't been any, any bigger catalyst uh, for these things we're talking about, of course. And so, Brett, like we, we, we talked about this a bit before about how, and even within that beginning of this podcast about how a uh, game development and collaboration is going to change forever. Right. Um, mm-hmm. In my opinion, for the better. And a lot of it is just talent is kind of spread throughout the world that haven't been able to be fully utilized because we always have these central metro cities pretty much uh, where Mm -hmm. game development studios kind of like building their studios around, which makes it super expensive. And of course, commute is kind of like our second breath uh, when it comes, when it comes to working in the game industry, right? It's just 45 minute ride today to work and then another 45 minute at least, right? If I'm lucky. Um, so how has that, uh, developed, uh, for the past few months since we talked, are you guys seeing more and more, uh, ways that, uh, these studios are improving their collaboration, uh, their brute force or, or kind of coming up with innovative, uh, ways to kind of work with each other better? 
Yeah, I mean, for sure. So the, uh, you know, I think um, one of the things I know that we did at Perforce and I, I know other companies are doing it as well is we, we basically said, all right, people now aren't, like you said, sitting in the car for 45 minutes. My commute used to be an hour and a half into Boston um, uh, each way. The Instead of wasting your time doing that, people are, are, are available. They're online. And uh, with things obviously like Slack and Zoom, um, people are trying to – people still yearn for that face-to-face. It doesn't have to be like – skin close to skin, but it's got to be look somebody in the eye and have a conversation. And so we definitely, and a lot of our customers uh, did the same thing where we just amped up the amount of these, you know, video chats. Uh, people are much better about being on Slack, um, less email. It's weird. It's, it's, I've, I've definitely seen a drop in email and an increase in Slack. Mm. Um, and just with the more zoom meetings, et cetera, people are staying more real time in their, um, in their communication. So, uh, collaboration is very key. People feeling, you know, even though they're spread apart, it's really important for people to still feel like they're part of a team. You know, uh, I'm sure we're not u- unique in the fact that, you know, we had it right from the beginning, we had Thursday night happy hours, right? Mm-hmm. Where people are spread out all over the place. Um, we're based out of Minneapolis. I live in New Hampshire and, you know, we're, ha- you know, having a beer or, you know, virtually um, the kind of stuff like that people have, have implemented. And I don't see, I don't see that going away. Even if people start to come back into the office, I think people like, uh, being connected. The other area where we've seen people invest is in tooling, right? So things like Handsoft that Johan manages is a, you know, it's a collaboration tool, right? Uh, very popular in the gaming industry. Um, but getting data instead of on somebody's whiteboard, uh, written down somewhere, et cetera, getting it into a system yeah. that people can share regardless of the where, where they are in the world, uh, has made a big difference. And, if you've solved the problem for people that are 45 minutes away, right, and no longer driving to the office, then you've solved the problem for people that are 4,500 miles away, right? Because it's the same technology. So it's really, you know, it's always everything, everything I've ever seen in business comes down to people process and tools. And it's with the people, uh, you know, are you taking care of them? Are they are they set with what they need? Are you staying in contact with them? You know, process is how people interact with each other. Uh, are you looking for efficiencies? Are you trying to break down, uh, you know, barriers, getting rid of manual work and operations and automating as much as possible? Um, and then the tools, do you have the right tool set to, to have the process you need to go faster? So people, you know, like you mentioned, Brandon, earlier, a lot of us, we got little kids and you know, you're trying to teach, you're trying to trying to feed them, you're trying to get your work done. So you have to be really efficient in your job. So you're not up till four o'clock in the morning working just to get your, you know, everything you need to do done, um, let alone try to have some fun in there in between. So really working smart, looking, you know, automation, the right tool set, taking care of your people, over communicating real time. It's helped sort of Uh, It certainly helped our company navigate these uh, strange times. And I know uh, a lot of the customers that uh, that we talk to um, from big to small have done the same approach and it's working. It's working well for everybody, but it just really forced everybody to kind of step back and learn. But as a result, like I said before, once kind of this all dies down, those best practices that people learn, the tools that people put in place those are going to carry forward and make, make them even better ship faster, ship higher quality product uh, overall. So, you know, the net result is, you know, will be stronger for it and more efficient. Mm-hmm. And I, I kind of mentioned this before, right? A lot of these companies, we are in a special time. I don't think this, if it wasn't COVID, no companies would spend this much resources to figure this out because they have to get things done. Right. Um, right. I don't think of any scenarios that this would have happened this way. And so a lot of people, especially with the kids thrown in the mix, uh, they are really forced employees, you know, level are, are forced to be very efficient with their time. You know, it's like, Hey, I might only have three hours today. So right. this and this and this and that. So it's going to be a lot of aching pain for a few weeks to a month to figure that out. But because people need to get work done and get paid, uh, they are having no choice but to <laughs> brute force it through. I mean, it, it's a really odd 
advantage to what's happening. Um, and I think this is the only period that we're actually going to walk out of this with a uh, alternative to being on site. Uh, th- this was the only way that we would have done it, uh, right. in my opinion. Um, so uh, another question that I have for you guys is that um, this year, a lot of things have happened, of course. Uh, new NVIDIA cards kind of make my $1,500 last year kind of useless. And then, <laughs> and then UE5, your Unreal Engine 5, being a huge game changer that really excited everybody about what's next for game development. How, how has that factored into people being stuck at home and now like are, are, are glued to every new tech that is coming out? I mean, are, are these things obviously have been planned, right? It took years for these things to, to have happened, but it's like kind of brushing on what I was saying before. It seems like every month there's 2020 feels really long and it seems like a lot <laughs> of things have been, been announced every month in terms of technology. Um, do you feel like it's, it's one of those things that they're, they're just, just trying to throw it on a news feed because everyone is paying attention to it now, or is it because it's been a seller because people are more effective because we need these type of tools out and about, uh, to continue game development. I mean, I'll, I'll go quick right. and then Johan jump in. I mean, I think, uh, you know, some of these things take, you know, years and years, like Johan said, years and years to develop, but I think the. We're certainly noticing it more, right? Because we have time. We're not distracted by other things. I think people are that haven't been uh, job-wise affected uh, uh, by COVID, they're spending their money, though. You know, a lot of years, somebody might be like, I'm not going to spend $1,500 on graphics cards because I'm going to go do this project or I'm going to go take a trip and a vacation this year. Well, if you got a vacation in the budget, you're not going on vacation right now. Might as well use it for something fun on the inside of the house. Uh, so I think people are spending more uh, on these types of things because it's easier to justify. Um, I think they're uh, same with the phones and all that. I mean, you know, years ago, and I think that's why the gaming didn't uh, the the innovation and the gaming around. Uh, mobile phones wasn't there because the phones couldn't do it. Yeah. Maybe you could do fruit ninja, right. Yeah. But you're not, you know, playing a triple game game on there. The the phones couldn't handle it. Uh, hard to test. Right. Uh, that's why like, you know, with, uh, at Perforce, we have the product perfecto that can automate completely automate testing of mobile applications and games. Right. Cause you got to have that velocity and the quality is getting higher. The expectations there um, you're going from, 99 cent games because they're kind of worth 99 cents and you're trying to sell a high volume to higher tier, closer to AAA rated games. Nobody would spend 60 bucks on a video game for their phone eight years ago. Right. Um, and that's, that's where we're headed. So it's kind of like demand and uh, product are, are intersecting. Um, I think there's been a lot of visionaries for sure um, in, in the market and to hear where like with some of our customers where, the, the stuff that they're thinking about um, that's five years from now, it's, it's, it's amazing. So the innovation train is going to keep running. And then when you see things like people taking gaming technologies into other markets, you did mention it real quick, like with the Mandalorian and, and virtual production, yeah. we're taking best practices, the ability to deliver something cheaper and faster, right. Than doing it all ourselves or filming around with green, green screens and doing post-production. I mean, the way they built the Mandalorian is incredible. And, you know, we're being pulled into that world heavily uh, because of our partnership with Epic. Um, that was all done in the Unreal Engine. And I think you're going to see more and more of that because people are learning. You don't need to have, to have all the actors on the set at the same time. We don't have to do all this crazy post-production stuff. Actors are looking at real screens with real worlds behind them rather than looking at, a, you know, a bunch of green stuff. Uh, so I think quality of things are going up. And I think the... Uh, you know, a lot of these, you know, technology companies, you know, they, 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 it's a, it's a big family. I mean, they compete with each other, but they're all pushing each other to go faster and get more stuff to market. And the, the hardware vendors, you know, it, it does no good to, you know, to have, uh, you know, NVIDIA's latest, you know, massive influx of, uh, of video cards that are super high powerful and cheaper if there's nothing to run on them, right? If we don't have these, you know, advanced games, you know, 4k going to 8k, then what's the, what's the point, 
So they all kind of work together uh, for the overall greater experience. And it's a, it's kind of a cool time right now, as far as all these technology advancements, like I said, it comes in any kind of industry, these technology things come in waves about every five to seven years. So I think we're kind of at the beginning of that right now. And it's probably also, I mean, one thing I've noticed and one reason why maybe it feels a bit different this year is also that you don't have the trade shows. You don't have E3 and GDC and all of those where you can announce all of these big changes and you get like a spike, you know, this is my week. I know all the news are going to come out. I can go and listen to Microsoft. I can go listen to all of these and they're going to tell me what's new. But now all those marketing department has to find a different way of, of announcing these and telling us about them and reaching it out. And I guess that's why we're being fed this continuously digitally. And I mean, working with many game development studios, what, what I'm hearing also, and we had one of these answers coming back from the survey that resonated very well with that was, you know, some of these changes comes kind of, you know, you don't know that as a developer of a game building for, you know, coming back to VR for Oculus or something, and suddenly they're making changes to their next generation of, of something. And, you know, how do we adapt and, and be agile about when we realize, well, the underlying technology are going to change and we're in the middle of a project. And we might be able to need to adapt that now to support that next generation of technology. So the response we're in back is what we need to get in the industry is, is better cross-organizational collaboration. Because I mean, there's the changes that are being made on, on the underlying tech, and then you know, Unity or Unreal making changes. How do you collaborate with the game developers and how do they collaborate with, for example, their publishers, with outsourcing companies and all of these vendors? How do you achieve, for example, cross-organizational agility. How do, you, how do you make that collaboration better? Is something that is, is what I'm hearing at least and what we heard also responses about something that, that is potentially you know, the next kind of level here when it comes to you know, moving away from Agile being your two-week sprints to Agile being actually, we're a value stream here of many different organizations that's doing a wide range of different things, but it needs to work together for us to be able to adapt quickly when innovation happens. And especially now when we're taking this big leap as, as Brad was talking about. You know, and one of the pushes, I think, because how like geographically the walls have been torn down that uh, inclusivity and, and accessibility to a lot of game developers are becoming more and more important where um, I think one of the biggest things I think with last of us Two, right. They, they had like a whole future on making sure that uh, it's playable for for people who um, who have issues playing it uh, regularly uh, was one of the biggest news that I've heard about accessibility in game development in a AAA game for a long time, and uh, I feel like uh, in a couple other instances this year, uh, because everyone's meeting online now, that has been increasingly uh, been more. Uh, made aware for, for everybody who's doing online conferences, especially people hard of hearing or deaf, uh, you know, all these Zoom meetings, you know, you're, you're going to have to need an interpreter or, or a captionist uh, to kind of help with getting on with work, right? So uh, these are un other issues that are being brought to attention. Um, how are you guys are seeing that with, uh, with that increase with game development? Um, uh, I think there was a like a like a section in the, in the survey kind of talking more about this. If you guys can expand on that part, that'd be great. On the inclusivity, I mean, particularly what people talked about the the ability to have work life balance. I mean, not only being allowed to have people working for you that can put in you know sixteen hours of work during crunch periods and so forth, moving into actually being something that you can do during during normal work hours, and also making sure you can do that in a balanced way actually opens up the ability to include many, many more people in the game development process in itself. And then when it comes to the actual product side of it, that, that making sure you include accessibility features in the games. I don't, this is probably not something we've got a clear response, to, but I'm thinking that, you know, in some ways, maybe if you're putting constraints on the things you can do in the sense, you know, we're going to build a game for, for someone with a certain disability here who can't see certain colors or who can't here or something like that. You know, that might be something that is, is pretty intriguing from a game design uh, aspect. I'm, I'm not an expert on this, but it was something that we heard that people were, you know, putting accessibility features into games is, is something that they think is important for them. But, but uh, why it is important for them, in addition to just making sure that more people can play it, is, is uh, not something that I think we saw a clear reason for. 
you know, and just, uh, you know, again, from sort of the, the, the perfecto side with the mobile testing, there is a big push with a lot of uh, those customers to, uh, especially around the online banking, because you don't have an option, right? You have to use that software to do your banking, especially when people aren't allowed to, before they could actually go to these, you know, brick and mortar banks and more and more of these banks are trying to reduce their physical footprint and go more virtual. And there are federal guidelines on accessibility um, uh, testing compliance so that people can do something that is important and basic as managing their banking. So uh, building accessibility into those mobile applications is a critical part of those banking business. They have to have it. So that's why they put the time into it. I think as we see the mobile gaming becoming more, what I, even though there's billions of them out there, more quote unquote serious, right? And it becomes a bigger part of the revenue stream for some of these major players in the gaming industry. That has to come along with it. You cannot alienate a, 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 a certain population of your of your customers because they can't see well or they can't hear well. There has to be, you know, uh, different color contrast models that that have to be there as an option. You have to have audio help, et cetera, so that they can have uh, an enjoyable, capable experience. So. Uh, you know, I hate to say it, but unfortunately, that's going to follow along with the revenue potential. Um, that's just kind of the way it works for these for the larger companies. Yeah, and speaking of revenue potential, there was a uh, funding for for game development projects have always been a, a major part of game development, right? I mean, uh, yep. there's a million people with great ideas, but a small percentage actually has the money to kind of follow through with it. Uh, do you guys mind kind of talking more about this and um, how this year have decelerate, accelerate, keep people from getting their projects funded? Yeah, I mean, I think, you know, first off, like, we recognize that. I mean, that's why we have our Indie Studio Pack, where it's, you know, all of Helix Core unlimited, you know, usage and uh, comes along with uh, with uh, licenses for Handsoft as well. So to let them get started. Because the thing is, if you're building a game, just because you had a very small team doesn't mean your needs are small. You still have big files that you're working with. You still might have people uh, in Sweden and uh, in, in, in New Hampshire and California, right, that are trying to collaborate. So that's kind of one of the things that, that uh, we want to do because we know every, every startup gaming company, a lot of them are bootstrapping this with their own money, their own time. They're trying to pay for cloud costs or whatever they're doing. Um, so that's something we see as a great opportunity for us to help, uh, those folks get started. But yeah, that was, that was the number one challenge that came out of the survey was we just don't have the funding to, to get moving and people are getting money from friends They're, you know, uh, some of them are, are like, you know, legit investors that they're finding, but they just don't know how to go about finding the funding. And I think that is an area where, um, there could be an opportunity to help, uh, educate um, you know, educate your listeners, right? Uh, what, what are the best methods? Who do you talk to? How do you put a business proposal together? Because it's not about, well, geez, I got this cool, you know, drawing of a, of a character I want in a game, you know, give me $2 million to go build it. it. You really has to, you don't get money unless the person giving you the money can see a clear path to revenue return, right? Um, but that's the number one challenge. And so there's a lot of talented people out there that have great ideas for the games they want to create, but they don't know how to get the money because that's not what they do, do. They weren't taught how to do that. So I think that there's a gap from what we're seeing. there's a big gap uh, in the community uh, of knowledge around how to approach, you know, getting the funds you need to properly build the game. I don't know, Johan, do you have any other comments on that? I mean, my main comment is that we did a survey after the pandemic happens and, you know, is your biggest problem now to work remote and so forth? No, your number one problem is still funding. And I mean, for in the survey here, to be honest, a lot of the, the respondents were smaller game studios where you typically have more of a, a funding issue. But this, despite everything else that is going on in the world, this remains, you know, top of mind when it comes to challenges they need to overcome in the short term. Might have a great idea, but realizing that, executing on that, having a good plan in place so you can convince, for example, publishers or, or others to fund you to realize that vision is is something that uh, remains a key challenge. And I, I. Uh, it would be interesting to know if, if studios have found it more or less difficult to get, you know, how do you convince publishers and others to fund you when, when with, with over a Zoom meeting in contrast to meeting in, in a small meeting room at a conference. But uh, uh, yeah, 
that's that's uh, there's a lot of good great game ideas out there that's probably not getting enough attention yeah, I mean, and, in the survey, forty-one percent of the people said they they weren't even sure how to find a backer. They didn't even right. know where to look to find the money. And that's, you know, I, I just think there's an opportunity for for, for someone to be able to kind of reach this the same audience that you have and and kind of help guide guide people. I think that would be a, a cool trend if that could kind of pick up. Yeah, it's definitely a a real thing. I, I mean, I, I think the way that we're forced to do zoom meetings for, for, for investment money and asking for money. It's like the equivalent of getting a phone call from a telemarketer. You just don't trust, you know, yep. no matter how good the idea is, there is like a, it's hard to replace the face to face interaction because a lot of investors, I think get their uh, feel for the founders or the game developers by being in person. And mm-hmm. it's less about the idea, but more about how that person is. And mm-hmm. it's still very hard to do that through a flat screen. Um, yep. And so increasingly, like more people are, are finding it hard, you know, by even getting to that point with through cold email calls. Right. Um, right. And I, I, did, I think there hasn't really been a decrease of interest to 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 for investors to provide funding. It's just I think the the problem is still is the same on both ends. It's like investors are having a hard time finding the, the studios and the studios are having a hard time finding where the investors hang out. It's almost like there needs to be some kind of internet hub uh, that match makes <laughs> these guys because it, it, it is uh, it's a good product idea. It's a good product idea. Yeah. It's increasingly weird that uh, we haven't figured this part out. And, yeah. Um, uh, this is the time to figure it out. A lot of people right. with money just want to put the money into something. Yeah. There is still, I can tell you for sure, there is still tons and tons of investment money out there. That hasn't slowed down one drop. And a matter of fact, in some cases, it's picked up because people are, uh, they can get better deals when they're investing. Um, there's lots of opportunity, there's lots of innovation happening. And, you know, to your point, and I really just wanted to echo it, um, just so, you know, you know, your listeners can, you know, when they go down this route, think about, I was told a long time ago, starting a company that, uh, 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 investors, venture capitalists, private equity firms, et cetera, they don't just invest in the product. That's part of it. They invest in the team, right? They have to believe in the team and trust them and know that they're going to do the right thing with their money. I mean, great product ideas are a dime a dozen, but finding a really good solid team um, is key. And if you can come across that, you know what you're talking about, that you've got a plan um, that you can execute on that plan it will go miles and miles in helping convince an investor to, 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 you know, to trust you with their, with their funds. It's a, it's a, it's a really big part of the deal. Yeah. And I think one of the other challenges too, and although there, there's a weird feeling that we have an increase of time where people are at home all, all the time uh, to figure things out. Um, there is also uh, a feeling of not enough time, especially when recruiting new people onto the team. Before it was kind of more straightforward. There's an onboarding process. You walk in through the office, you do this and that. Now you got to do it through a tech. And individually, you know, uh, a lot of companies are still figuring it out, are doing it person to person on a person to person basis, which takes a lot of time, right? To walk through the documentation. And even if you hand a documentation that's well documented, there's no guarantee that people read it all through. I mean, how many meetings right. have we been through? It's like, didn't you read paragraph 2.15? <laughs> it's like, no, nah, I'm going to spend all my days. Uh, that I mean, that was, onboarding is the most boring process and it's the hardest to automate because it's so boring. Um, right. And there needs to be always a guide. Uh, what have you guys heard has worked with that, with hiring new people during this time? Even though I see a lot of listing, more and more pe- companies are needing more people. There seems to be a huge increase of job listings uh, more than before in this period. Uh, Any- do you have anything said? <laughs> yeah, yeah, no, sure. So, yeah. I mean, I, I can give you an example. I hired a, you know, I hired a guy to work with me, and it was right in the middle of all this, or right at the beginning when when it was super, you know, uh, locked down. And I, I, it, it was difficult because it really fell on me to do the bulk of the training. Um, but uh, a lot of uh, online whiteboard sessions, right? Because yeah. there's a big aspect to what 
the folks at me need to learn, uh, you know, uh, not just the product. That's easy. You could download a product and learn it and read the manual and install it, et cetera. But really key concepts, right? Strategy. Um, so there was just hyper communication uh, that had to that had to happen. And then some people just have to jump in with both feet. One of the things that I know that's and again, obviously the guy is very smart, so it, it worked out very well. Um, one of the things that um, uh, we've seen some of our gaming uh, customers do is they just make sure that they've got the right environments ready, right? So that people don't need to figure out how to get this tool they need installed and what port do they have to go to to connect to this other product? And, you know, a lot of these gaming environments that people have, you know, they've got the IDE, they've got the engine, they've got, you know, connector tools, they've got obviously Helix Core, they got Handsoft, they've got all kinds of stuff that they need to be set up in. And what has helped is the customers that I've talked to are the ones that have that kind of automated, right? Somebody's being onboarded, boom, they've got a machine that's got everything loaded or one of these virtual environments where everything's loaded and ready to go. And in that way, they don't have to waste time figuring that out. But then it's just, it's, uh, it's honestly, it's, it's a lot of brute force, right? Uh, taking people through stuff, letting them get their hands dirty uh, and a lot of meetings and a lot of collaboration. There's no, there's no secret sauce. There's no magic because, you know, somebody might know, you know, C++, that's great, but here's how we do it here. Right. Here's our coding standard. Here uh, is what our environment looks like. And here's why maybe what you did before doesn't directly translate. So we have to teach you. So there's education code reviews. Those things kind of come into play. Right. Um, you know, reviews of the assets people are creating, et cetera. So there's a there's got to be a, a, a not a long tail, but a short cycle, fast feedback loop for these new new employees uh, to help them quickly course correct. And, and kind of get up to speed. But it's 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 hard work by the employer and hard work by the new employee. There's just really no way around that. And you do you have anything to add to that? I mean, like sharing, I mean, skill building and sharing knowledge within a team is something that was brought up as a big challenge as we serve this. And also we can, you know, probably recognize from many places and there's nothing, you know, nothing more boring than to get a lengthy document to try to learn something that way. So in, from that perspective, I mean, it's about learning, I guess, how to use the digital tools and how to use them in a more democratic way. You know, actually, you have a digital trace of almost everything that we're doing now, which we didn't have before. You know, that conversation that happened over, you know, a coffee or, or you know, people just talking to each other, that's now, a, you know, a, a threaded comments in Slack. We have, you know, all the comments in something like Handsoft. We have people participating, maybe doing estimation together to learn from each other. But it's just making sure to, to use the additional transparency you can get actually from, from uh, the way we work now. But how can we make that easy to consume so we don't drown in documents, for example, and make that something living, right? Like you have a single source of truth and it's always something that lives long. So when you bring new people on board, you know, bring in their skills, but also make sure that you as a team can maintain the skill base. That seems to be a big a big thing to to learn and to overcome and it's always the, the people who do it the best are going to get the, the highest performing team so then it's going to show up in, in great products so we're, we're about at the hour mark and i kind of want to leave you guys off with one last question so uh two big studios and small studios alike from everything that we talked to and a lot of gems that you guys kind of handed out those nuggets uh, a lot of developers can can actually take and and, and improve well, what was the one thing that you guys uh, would advise for developers? Let's just say the the next two years of this. Uh, what they should they focus on to kind of uh, set themselves up for success? What would they be? We can start with you, Brett. Yeah, that's a great question. I mean, there's 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 a number of things, but I think you know, obviously, you know, the obvious ones of just, you know, staying up with the technology are great. So I'm going to give you multiple things. I can't just do one. Right. Um, the, uh, but I think, I think really looking at how you do your work, um, you know, around being efficient, um, and not burning out. I think that's a big challenge people have had in this environment because you know what, I'm home and can't go see anybody and you know, my computer's on. And so I might as well just keep chugging away uh, so I can get ahead or, you know, that I, I want to do that to try to stand out. Uh, and that's cool. That works in short bursts, but that's extremely unhealthy. Uh, I think it's really important for people to kind of stay fresh, 
and get a little bit of balance there and, you know, shut the computer off or, you know, go play a game or go talk to somebody if you can uh, that lives in the house. But uh, try to stay connected, but try to stay in some sense of normalcy so you don't burn out and start resenting what you do. Because if you do it because you love it, you don't want it to become, you know, something that you resent. And you'll be better for it. You're going to come across better in meetings. Uh, You're going to do better work if your mind is right. And so I just highly encourage everybody to take some time for themselves and work on their communication. Communication is a lot harder when you're not face to face with somebody. Those, you know, quote unquote, water cooler conversations that happen that, you know, in my, in the course of my career, uh, learned a lot of things about a lot of different people and, and, and picked up some really good, you know, nuggets of wisdom um, in the water cooler conversations. So it's, you know, it made some quick decisions, right? Um, try to have that sort of a mindset, even in this remote world, like just reach out to somebody, ping them, say, hey, let's jump on a quick Zoom call and uh, or Slack call. And just, I got a question, I just need an answer quick, or there's a decision, don't fret about the decision. Call somebody, make a decision, move on with your life, right? So just to be more efficient in what you're doing, you're probably learning these skills today anyways. Like like you said, people are trying to balance their family and, you know, their personal life along with working. Um, It's really challenging. So just, I just think try to be as efficient with work as possible and you know keep the communication and collaboration at a super high level and you'll be a better better person for it you're going to be a better employee for it and it's going to help open up your eyes a little bit uh for the future opportunities that you might have all right your turn you on i have a little bit shorter answer i think but i mean my number one advice is to embrace true agility as we learned i mean game development is very much an adapt or die industry and what I mean by like true agility is, is, you know, just because you got a thousand year issues and then put them in two week sprints, you're not agile, right? Mm-hmm. So go back, read the agile manifesto, do things. You know, there are methods, there are, are structures, there are ways in place that people have tried that is kind of proven on how you can learn to adapt rather than die. So, you know, make sure that whatever you do, don't stop, don't evolve, stop evolving your methods of building games and think like now we're, you know, we found it. We're satisfied to sit down and do this work in this way. You know, we, what we what we learned during the first three months of COVID, let's continue like that forever. No, you know, you continuously need to evolve uh, how you work and, and how the methods that you apply to organize as a team. And, and yeah, the, like we talked about, democratize all the information. I think that's that's uh, going to set the winners apart from, from the people who's going to struggle. I, I uh, completely agree. I think that the... the 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 resolving uh, calmness uh, that has done it for me is that I'm seeing these pockets of success from different companies going through COVID that they are figuring this out and like you said Johan like I think the more sharing will eventually have this full form functioning studio or company that just are just doing fine. There's going to be a lot of outcries. I'm like I was very surprised that. Uh, with whole, the whole Netflix, I think out of everybody, and I'm sure you guys have friends over there. Is like they're riding the wave, right? They're enjoying life. Like a, it's a streaming company. It's like you guys should figure this out. To hear that they're they're having problems, but then I on the other side, I hear other companies doing very well and uh, peace of mind, and employees are enjoying kind of like this forced staycation and uh mm-hmm. acquiring the skills and discipline, most importantly, necessary uh, that actually extend beyond their the, the workplace they're at right now that that carries forward to when they go back in the office or they continue to work remotely i think the 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 the, the things that you learn during this period about yourself and how you work is just gonna be a lifelong skill and so um it, it's very encouraging to see like different pockets of the industry figuring different parts of uh, uh, the struggle uh, separately. And again, you know, hopefully with the podcast, with this episode, especially, uh, with other uh, avenues, uh, these companies are, are starting to kind of trade secrets or not really secrets, but like trade, like ways to kind of make it through. Yep. And, yep. um, I, I think that's the very, uh, it's a very good thing. Uh, industry as a whole have been kind of 
living in on separate uh, sectors like the mobile space never really talked to AAA. the indie guys are kind of like in their own weird corner so everyone has been like separated for a long time and if anything this is the perfect time to get together you can trade best practices and and tell each other how to get funding <laughs> which is <it's, it's>, like <laughs> you guys figure it out someone figure it out come on let people know but uh yeah i mean that's pretty much it uh before i end though i want to throw the mic over to you guys i want to thank you for your time to kind of give attention to uh tell people where to go uh, uh anything that you want to talk about uh the mic is yours you go first johan I mean, go to perforce.com. There's so much to discover that we're doing. There's so much happening at Perforce right now. We're so I'm working primarily on, on the hands off side, which is a project management tool and it has to do trying to do quite a bit on when it comes to backlog management. So if if you have any form of needs of really good backlog management practices and, and uh, get best practices, as you just mentioned, Brandon, I think we have a lot of really good resources there you can find as well as tools you can try out and, and, and so forth. Yeah, and for me, it's just, uh, you know, I've kind of pl plugged our Helix core quite a bit the last three times. And Brandon, by the way, the next time I think I'm going to do this in studio with you once we can. I mean, one of these times i got to be in there with you. Okay. Um, <laughs> <laughs> uh, it just, you know, like I said, that indie studio pack, if you're a smaller studio and you want to get started for free, you're going to eventually need Perforce. Everybody does that does any kind of large gaming. Um, it, download for free. Um, the indie studio pack comes along with hands off so you can just get up and running. Um, and we, you know, love to hear from you, love to get your feedback. Um, and it will help you do geographically distributed development, pushing around big files. Like I said, you're going to need it at some point anyways. Everybody does in the gaming industry. Um, so it's uh, we're happy to do that for you folks. And um, again, just uh, keep cranking, keep working hard and keep the innovation coming as a as a recipient of all your hard work. It's super enjoyable. And, um, you know, it's uh, as always, Brandon, great talking to you. And it's, uh, we always learn stuff, uh, you know, from you. And hopefully uh, your audience can learn some stuff from us. Absolutely. Uh, I'm definitely learning more from you than you guys are learning from me. Uh, Perforce is anything. has been a, like a career long favorite software, obviously. Uh, you guys are keeping professionals connected in a very huge way, especially in this world. Like it's just crappy for people running around with thumb drives uh, trying to give you files. So <laughs> it's a good thing. It's a good thing to have you guys around. Well, I want to thank you again for, for both of you coming on and, and sharing the knowledge. Uh, it sounds like everything is getting better despite everything. Um, it's just one of those things that you just got to figure it out. And I think as an industry, we're, we're figuring it out. Uh, right. Necessarily, we, we got to figure it out. So I want to thank you for your time. I want to thank you everybody for listening. I want to see you guys next week. Awesome. Take care. Take thank care. You.